This is Jeff Van Gundy. The year is 1998, and Jeff is coach of the Knicks. He's trying to stop a fight at the end of a Knicks Heat playoff game, and he is failing. He's failing because a fight between these two men, Alonzo Mourning and Larry Johnson, is really two fights. It's one battle in a basketball war between two Eastern Conference rivals. And it's one battle in a personal war between two men with way more between them than meets the eye. Jeff is also failing because he's like 150 pounds. If you're a Knicks fan, like I am, that fight in 1998 made your heart sink into your stomach. If you're not a Knicks fan, uh, first of all, congratulations, and second of all, I can explain. It starts with a breakup. In the early 90s, Pat Riley coached the Knicks. His teams were very tough and very good, but repeatedly fell short of a championship because of these guys. In 1995, New York was still a team on the rise, but Riley wanted more power and more money. So he took a job as the coach and president of the Miami Heat. He notified the Knicks by sending them a fax. People are still very grumpy about this. Under Riley, the Heat got very good very fast, thanks in large part to the addition of Alonzo Mourning. And as luck would have it, Miami faced the Knicks in the playoffs four years in a row, starting in 1997. The basketball was vicious and low scoring, and it was full of clutch moments. Got it! With eight left. Anyway, this war really stood out for the stuff that wasn't basketball. And one moment near the beginning would color the rest of the rivalry. The Knicks had the upper hand in the 1997 Eastern Conference semifinals until garbage time of game five when P.J. Brown flipped Charlie Ward over his head. All the Knicks' best players hopped off the bench to join the melee, and each of them got suspended for one of the remaining games, which the Heat won to steal the series. They have become the sixth team of the history of the NBA to come back from a 3-1 deficit. So when the Knicks and Heat met in the first round the very next season, and the Knicks had game four in the bag to tie the series at 2 all and all of a sudden, some physical play between Johnson and Mourning devolved into a fist fight, everybody was like, oh no, not again. I don't know what Van Gundy thought would happen here, but all he wanted was to prevent more suspensions. But he didn't prevent anything. Both Morning and Johnson missed the decisive game five. This time, New York ended up winning. Yet another Knicks Heat series with an asterisk because of suspensions. But this wasn't just another New York-Miami fight. This had subtext. These guys had gotten into it before, a couple times. And people insinuated that the Johnson Morning beef occupied a separate universe beyond the Knicks Heat rivalry, that there was something personal between them. To understand this weird, intimate subplot within one of the NBA's best rivalries, this beef within a beef, you'd have to go back to another team at another time, another breakup. And this is beef history, so obviously we're going to do that. In 1991, the Charlotte Hornets sucked. They won the first pick and snagged Larry Johnson, the dunk machine who'd led UNLV to a championship a year prior. In 1992, they used the second pick on Alonzo Mourning, Georgetown's Big East Player of the Year. Johnson and Mourning were both 20-point, 10-rebound guys right out of the gates, and they led one of the most efficient, fastest-paced offenses in the whole league. Make way, here comes a bunch of young guns! Charlotte made the playoffs for the first time in 1993, and they won their first ever series on a Mourning buzzer beat. Riley's Knicks beat Charlotte in the next round, but everything was looking up entering the offseason. With two rising superstars, Charlotte looked on the verge of a super team. And the Eastern Conference suddenly became wide open when Chicago's Michael Jordan announced he was walking away from the game. It was time to secure the future, so the Hornets struck a deal with Johnson. $84 million for 12 years, the biggest contract in NBA history, signed the exact same day MJ retired. October 6, 1993 was a huge shock for the NBA. Hornets owner George Shin called Johnson the leader of his team, said he'd always be the leader. He was worth it. Meanwhile, Hornets president Spencer Stolpen told people Johnson wasn't even Charlotte's best player. And yeah, about that. By all accounts at the time, Johnson and Mourning got along great. That was not the case. These guys were both number one alpha dog types by the time they left college, and now they each expected to be the face of an up and coming franchise. Some say that relationship was bad from day one. There's a story that LJ would wear his Rookie of the Year leather jacket in front of Morning to taunt him. Morning wasn't Rookie of the Year because of this guy, but he established himself as a very good NBA player very quickly. The foul on O'Neal, the three-point play. Johnson had the flashy game and the beloved commercial character, <laughs> and now the fattest contract in the league. But Morning was already just as good on the floor, if not better. And so Zoe kind of panicked. After Johnson's massive contract, would there be enough left for him? Resentment brewed, and Morning blew his top one day, lashing out at Charlotte coach Alan Bristow. Practices got intense, and there was seething behind the scenes. 
When the younger Morning had trouble passing out of double teams, Johnson told teammates he was dumb and selfish. But LJ had his own problems. He'd injured a disc in his back during the summer, well before signing his contract, and the back problems got worse. He missed the first two months of 1994, and with Morning missing over a month himself because of a calf injury, the season became a wash. Charlotte won just 41 games and missed the playoffs. So 94-95 would be the season then, the one where Charlotte built on that historic first year with two stars. We know now that those two stars were beefing, but it didn't look that way. They came off like great pals as teammates on the 1994 Dream Team 2 in the FIBA World Championship. And anyway, Charlotte added 41-year-old Celtics legend Robert Parrish for a little veteran leadership. We know now that Johnson would never fully regain his high-flying form after the back injuries, but everyone was optimistic about his rehabilitation. The Hornets knew Morning would want an even bigger contract extension than Johnson's, but there were still two years before he'd become a restricted free agent, with Charlotte able to match any offer. Things were looking up again. People felt good. Charlotte was so hyped up that First Union Bank, the Hornets' sponsor, painted a massive mural of their stars on the side of the building. And the Hornets had a great year. LJ was healthy and playing like a star again, albeit a much less athletic one than before the injuries. Morning still didn't get as many touches as his slightly older and much richer teammate, but he carried the team anyway, leading the Hornets in scoring and anchoring a much improved defense. For the first time, Morning and Johnson played together in the All-Star game. Charlotte won 50 games, a franchise record, and entered the playoffs as the four seed with home court advantage against the Bulls. Just one problem. Chicago wasn't really a five seed. About a month before the playoffs began, MJ decided he was tired of baseball and abruptly rejoined the Bulls. And surprise, they got a lot better really fast. Welcome back, Michael Jordan. The Hornets had their chances in a five game first round series, but blew them. Muggsy Bogues missed a shot to win game one and the Bulls took the game in overtime. Charlotte won game two, but fell apart in game three as the Bulls totally locked up morning. morning has it stripped by Pete and in Game 4, Johnson airballed the shot that would have won the game and sent the series back to Charlotte. Sure, it's over! 95 was supposed to be the year the Hornets made a run, but nothing went their way. And around the same time Pat Riley was leaving the Knicks, this would be the end for Charlotte. A brief but ugly lockout in the summer of 95 spelled doom. And it was engineered by Morning's agent, David Falk. Under the new CBA, Morning was suddenly set to be an unrestricted free agent in 1996, which meant he had all the leverage, and he wanted an extension, now, for $13 million. So Hornets leadership freaked out in typical team executive fashion. Well, well, do you want us to charge more for tickets? Do, do you want us to go out of business? Charlotte was not going to pony up $13 million a year, but they didn't want to lose Morning for nothing, so they started accepting trade offers for their best player. One noteworthy offer came from the Lakers, who put Serbian center Vlade Divac on the block. I'm only mentioning this because less than a year later, Divac would get traded to the Hornets for the draft rights to a different guy. But the Hornets settled on a return package from Miami, centered around rising star Glenn Rice. On November 4th, 1995, the deal was finalized. Morning joined the Heat. It was Pat Riley's first huge splash as Miami president. And while LJ didn't miss Morning's company, he wasn't too thrilled with the players Charlotte got for him. So the 95-96 season was a grumpy one for Charlotte. 20 to nothing. For one, they had to figure out what to do with that huge likeness of Morning on the side of a skyscraper. They decided to repaint it and held a fan vote for who the new subject should be. The winner? Hugo, the Hornets mascot, busting through the wall like the Kool-Aid man. Alonso's gone to Miami, they've had to kind of go neutral and get Hugo to horn it up. Yeah. Just a year after devoting the city's biggest canvas to their stars of the future, Charlotte repainted with the one guy guaranteed to never leave them, which, yeah, this is all very depressing. When Morning returned to Charlotte in April of 1996, he got booed. And Johnson hit him with a flagrant foul, just for good measure. And the Hornets just missed the playoffs, falling one game in the standings behind Alonzo in the Heat. It was time for LJ to get out. And on July 13th, 1996, the Hornets dealt Johnson to the Knicks. Just a few days later, Morning signed a massive extension with Miami. And the rest, well, you know. This fight represented the climax of so many interpersonal dramas. It was like a turducken of beeves. That's old blood from Charlotte. On the outside was a bitter basketball rivalry that stemmed from an ugly breakup between coach and team. On the inside was an individual feud that included another breakup. With better timing and better luck, the Hornets may have rivaled the strongest dynasties of the 90s. Like so many breakups, you can't help but wonder what could have been. 